into our presence, into our minds, into our hearts, Lord. We yield ourselves to you, and we we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would have uh, just eminence in this place, yes. and in, in our thoughts, and in our minds. Mm. Lord, take every word that is spoken, and use it to glorify your Thank name. You. Thank Holy you, Holy Father, we ask all these things in your precious Son, Jesus' yes. name. Father, I would a like to add to yes. that one second. Don't amen it yet. Yes. Father God, I ask that whatever our brother is going to speak today, that the soil in this room yes. Yes, is rich yes. and fertile. Yes. Yes. That any seed that is planted mm -hmm. today is planted in ground that bears yes. much fruit. Yes. Father, yes. no empty words today. Yes. No yes. empty minds to hear. Nope. Yes. No yes. empty yes. souls. No mm -hmm. empty hearts, Father. Thank we you, speak Lord. and declare yes. the word of God mm -hmm. on fertile soil, mm -hmm. on Jesus. fertile Thank ground. You. Father, oh, no stones, mm -hmm. nothing to impede that word that goes forth today, yes. I declare it over every yes. single person yes. in this room. Jesus. You David. will receive from on high today more than you ever expected. And you will not Jesus. walk out with feet that aren't powerful feet to oh, proclaim Jesus. the gospel Jesus. in Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Seal it. I receive it. I receive it. Receive it. it. Seal, it. Seal it. Seal it. Seal it. Seal it. Mm -hmm. Now we say in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Anybody else going once? Going once. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Joshua chapter 10 today. Uh, last week, I... Uh, I don't. I don't remember when we did this. It was after it was the end of the at the end of the uh, meeting last week. We talked about throat punching mm -hmm. with Brenda. Yeah. And uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Our resident. Throat so there's there several people in the room that when they even hear that word, it just gives them a. Uh, they can't wait. So we're gonna, we're gonna, so. So I was, tell, I was telling uh, Brenda last week. I said there was there's a, a scriptural. Uh, uh, reference back reference back. for that. There's a, it's actually started in the Bible, and I said there was a point. I thought it was Gideon, but it wasn't. It was Joshua, where he, where Joshua had had uh, these five kings that he put his foot on the throat of mm -hmm. those five kings, and and that was the reference to throat punching. So Brenda texted me Sunday morning, and she said, "I've been up all night." throat punching. She said, I found it, Joshua 10. And uh, so I, 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 Sunday morning, I I went there and I read it and God just, boy, he just started hammering me. So I got to tell you this, on Saturday night, when I get done speaking, uh, I always feel that's so empty, so just, just drained. Because uh, I hear, I hear from God. He He gives me stuff, and then I give it to you. But I give you, God, everything I got. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know if I'm doing a good job of it or not, or it, mm -hmm. sometimes it seems anemic to me, but, but I'm always empty. I'm always, and I honestly, every Saturday night, I feel like I will never hear from God that way again. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not a good feeling, I can tell you. And so Saturday night... I went to bed and I was just thinking, man, it was so good today. God was so good. The, the holy, the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room was so powerful and so real, and there was so much authority in the word that was going out. And you know, when 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 you speak God's word and you feel when you have an authority that you recognize and walk in with it, and you feel the power that goes out because of the word of God, and you recognize that it's it's not you. It's not right. you, but you feel God, mm -hmm. you, you can feel his power mm -hmm. flowing through you. It's all connected to, mm -hmm. to that authority that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so when you feel that, it's, it's like the most addictive drug that you'll ever take. Because mm -hmm. wow. you just want more of it. You just want, it. It doesn't matter whether you're speaking to a group whether you're speaking to thousands, whether you're speaking to one person. On. When you speak with authority, yes. the word of God into an, into, into somebody's life, yes. you know what I'm talking about. Most of you have had this experience. And you speak the, the word of God. Sometimes you feel like, where did that come from? You're like looking around. Because you know it wasn't your thought. You know it was the word of God that came from God through you 
to that person. You know when it lands. The anointing. It's the anointing. It's the it's the authority. It's the power of God. It's all of that stuff. And when you have that experience, all you want to do is go have it again. Like you, you just want to go find somebody else. How can I speak into your life? And 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 you become like a crazed person because you just you just want to be used by God that way. Yes. It has nothing to do with you building your kingdom. It has right. nothing to do with you making a name for yourself or 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 uh, or anything like that. In fact, if if you're doing that, you know that right. that always leaves you feeling empty. Yeah. It always leaves you feeling like. Right here, it always leaves you feeling like, oh, it, it, like you, like you cheated somehow. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you, I, I've, I've had that experience before, and it's a, it's a, it's an ugly, nasty thing, and you, you don't ever want to go there again. Mm -hmm. But when the spirit of God flows through you, you just want to, you want to experience that again. You want to know what it's like. So every Saturday night, I go to bed feeling like that, like thinking, man, I will never be able to, to duplicate that. And, and I'm right, because you never can duplicate it. Right. You can't copy it. I've seen that happen, too, where we've tried to copy or duplicate something that God did yesterday, today. We can't do yeah. that. This week right. is different than that last yes. week. We're not going to speak True. and try to duplicate or recreate what True. happened last True. week. True. We're, we're getting a fresh mm -hmm. anointing from God this week. There's a, there's a fresh move of God in this oh. room right now. And it's for this week. It's for everybody that's in, in, in the room right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so Brenda texted me and I read this and, and I got that. that uh, it's, just a, it, it's just this amazing sense of, of, of being connected to God. Where he is speaking directly to your spirit, mm -hmm. and it's it's just it's I, it's it's there's nothing else like it in the world, and uh, so I'm I'm reading Joshua 10 and and uh, I, I, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm I, I feel like today is going to be a shotgun blast. Some some sermons are like are like rifle shots. If you know anything about guns at all, you know that that rifles are designed to shoot long and accurate. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, sharpshooters shoot rifles. And their guns are specially designed and, and have, have special, like what they call rifling in the barrel that's designed to spin the bullet as it comes out. So it starts and it goes long and straight. And, it, you know, a good rifleman, a, a long distance shooter can shoot uh, up to uh, maybe a mile or more than a mile away and, it, and hit a target just like within inches. Because it's that's the way it's designed. A shotgun doesn't work that way at all. A shotgun is a blast. It, it spreads out, and it's a shotgun shell. If you ever looked at one, it's loaded with buckshot, little tiny BBs, and when it comes out of the gun, it immediately spreads out. And but it the difference is, like if I would if I would have Scott stand up here and shoot a shotgun into this room, it would get several of you. And in fact, if he could get at the right distance, it would, get all, it would get all of us. So a rifle, he would have to, you know, pick us off one at a time. And, um, Don't get any ideas. <laughs> Which he could do, by the way. But, uh, but I feel like today, I feel like God wants to hit us with a shotgun blast. And so if, if everything seems a little bit... Uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to connect all the dots or, or connect everything today, but I, I want to give you what's in my heart. I want to give you what God has for us. Uh, so if, if it feels like sort of scattered, it, it's what God told me. I said, God, I said, I, 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 all week long I've been putting this together and God's been speaking to me. And all week long I've been, it's been like peace here and peace there and peace over here. And I'm like, God, I feel so scattered. I can't. And he said, I want it to be that way. So, so uh, just if, if, if it bothers you that it's sort of uh, not all connected, it's okay because the Holy Spirit will connect the dots mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. It might take a week. It might take a little bit of time, but, but you're, you're, you, you'll get there. So Joshua mm -hmm. in chapter 10, uh, just a little bit of, of backstory. In uh, Joshua and the nation, of the children of Israel come into the promised land. And they fought the battle of Jericho. We all know that, how they marched around the city seven times and the walls all fell in. And, 
And then after the Battle of Jericho, they fought another smaller city, the city of Ai. And if you know that story, you know that there was some challenges with that battle because, uh, number one, the, the Joshua took that battle too lightly, and he only sent part of the part of the troops up to fight it. He thought, well, we, we just defeated Jericho, this major thing. He says, we don't need everybody to go to Ai. And so he sent a, just a small contingent of soldiers up there, and they were routed and uh, chased back. And then, and then God told Joshua, he said, I'm sorry, I can't go any farther with you because there's sin in the camp. And that was the story of Achan. Remember, Achan, he was the guy that after Jericho had been had fallen, uh, God had told the, the people, had told Joshua, don't take any of the plunder for yourself. Everything belongs to me. This is this is my offering. This is everything. The gold, the silver, everything that belonged to Jericho, I don't want you touching it. I don't want you keeping any of it for yourself. Just leave it all there. Well, Achan took some for himself, and he hid it in his tent. And, and because of Achan's sin, one man's sin, came into the camp, and because of that sin, the, the presence of God, which is the anointing of God, which is the power of God, was no longer moving forward. They're, they were stopped right there. And, and God said, hold up, time out, going to deal with the sin here before we can move on. And so they did. Aiken was found out through a, a lottery type, a type of a lottery deal, and and uh, God used the, the that to single out Aiken, and they brought Aiken out, and they said, "Okay, Aiken, what'd you do?" And he said, "Well, I, I took what didn't what belonged to God. He tried to touch the glory of God. He said, uh, inside my head got a heart, head of my heart, whatever. Uh, as a result, Aiken was uh, was put to death." The death penalty for his sin, under the under the direction of God, and uh, as a result of him being punished and and that sin being taken care of, then Joshua and the army went up, conducted business with Ai, and so they move into the Promised Land. And they have uh, not easy victories, but somewhat easy victories, and uh, then in chapter nine. There's a group of people called the Gibeonites. They were, they were people from Gibeon, a town, a little city called Gibeon. And they, they were residents of the promised land. And uh, the Gibeonites had been watching all of this take place with Jericho and then with Ai. And, and they're seeing the, 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 they're witnessing the power of God is what they saw. And so they're afraid. They come to Joshua. And when they come to Joshua... They said, you know what? We'll never defeat them. We'll never be able to hold our own against them. And so they devised a plan. They said, let's try to trick them. We'll try to, we'll try to trick them into a, a peace treaty with us. So they sent an they sent a, a, uh, a entourage of men from Gibeon. And they had these men. They collected a whole bunch of moldy uh, bread put it in bags, and then they all gathered all their worn-out clothes, their worn-out shoes. They, they got animals that were worn out and exhausted, and they put all this stuff on those animals, and they set out, and they arrive at the camp of the Israelites. And when the, when the Israelites see them coming, they look like somebody that came from a long way away. And uh, they said, hey, we're here to make peace with you. And they said, we're, we're from way far away. I mean, we, we'll never be a problem for you. I, we, you. You know, you can have all this land because we live way, way, way far away. And they said, see, we've got, we've got moldy bread in our bags. This bread was fresh from the oven the day we left town. And, and look at our clothes. They're all worn out and threadbare. These were brand new clothes when we left. We had just been to TJ Maxx and decked ourselves out. And, and uh, when we left, we were, we were like just dressed to the nines. And, you know, one of the saddest verses in the Bible is it says in, in chapter 9, if you want to go back and read it sometime, it says that the Joshua and the, and the leaders looked at the moldy bread, looked at the worn out clothes, but didn't ask God. And as a result of that mistake, Joshua and the Gideons bought into the, or Joshua and the, and the Israelites bought into the ruse, and they signed a peace treaty with the Gibeonites. Only to find out a couple of days later that no, they were not from a long way away. They were next door neighbors. And they found out that they had done what God told them not to do, which was sign a peace treaty with the inhabitants of the land that, that they were going into. And they were disobedient to God, and they had made a mistake, but they had given their word. They had given their word 
and use the name of God to ratify this peace treatment with these people that they weren't supposed to have anything to do with. So they were in a bind. And uh, they couldn't, it, 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 was, it was sort of a catch-22. They really almost couldn't be obedient here because they couldn't, they weren't supposed to have a, a, a relationship with, with this group of people, but they had. They, had. they had made an agreement, and as a result of that, they were stuck. And so what part of the agreement was, these, these Gideonites had tricked Joshua and the Israelites into doing, part of the agreement was, if anything happens to us, the Gibeonites, you will come and to our aid, to our rescue. Because we're going, to be, we're going to be friends. We're going to be allies. And as part of our agreement, if something, if something bad happens to us, if we have enemies, now our enemies are your enemies. Covenant. See, when you make a, a, a bad agreement, you not only are coming into agreement with the people that you're coming into agreement with, but you're coming into agreement that they're in agreement with. And you are making their enemies your enemies. And so the, the, that's, there's a sermon there. I'm not going to preach it. But uh, God, so that's where, that's where they were. So in chapter 10, in verse 1, it says, Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, destroyed it go, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king. So this king, Adonai Zedek, is a major player in the in the uh, region in the area, and he is watching what's going on. He's wa all these kings. Remember, God told the nation of Israel. He said, "I want you to go into the promised land, and it's your land. I'm decreeing it. I'm saying it's your land. I want you to take that land and and take it not only for yourselves, but take it in my name." And so when uh, this Adonai Zedek is one of the, the main kings in the area. He's watching all of this. All of, all of the people that are living there are saying, man, what's, what is going on? This, this, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these Israelites show up. There have been rumors and stories about what had happened in Egypt 40 years ago with the plagues and the, and the, the Egyptians crossing the Red Sea. All of that was, was history to them. And they'd heard those stories. So they knew who these Israelites were, thought they, they'd heard about them. And so they're a threat. The nation of Israel is a threat to their way of life. We're supposed to be a threat to the way of the life, to, to the way of life to the enemy. Yeah. Yes. And I know some of us aren't comfortable with that, but we are supposed to be a threat. The nation of Israel was a threat to the enemies of God. God designed it that way. We're God's people, and we are supposed to be a threat. They're supposed to have heard about us. Mm -hmm. And so they're watching this. When they hear about the peace treaty that the Gibeonites made with uh, Israel, Adonai Zedek, he calls all of his buddies, to, well, they're not buddies, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're local kings. They're all these five different kings. And he calls them all together. He says... Uh, Verse 2, he and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all of its men were good fighters. So they're looking at, they're watching Jericho and Ai, and they're thinking, well, you know, Ai, that's a small little deal. It's not a big deal. But then Gibeon goes over to them, and they look at Gibeon, and they think, well, Gibeon's a big deal. All of a sudden, it gets really real for the enemies of God, what's going on here. And because of the threat of Gibeon, who was a major force in the area, and they're now, they've now made a peace treaty with Israel. See, this treaty thing went both ways. And so Adonai Zedek, Zedek king of Jerusalem, in verse 3, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jamuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Those are the five kings. And they were all major players in the area. So they, they all band together. Now before this, they weren't really allies. They were, they were sort of, they sort of had a, uh, we'll leave you alone if you leave us alone type of an arrangement. So they didn't wage war on each other, but they weren't exactly friends either. Everybody, there was these five different kings scattered around, and they all operated their own thing. 
But because of this threat to their way of life, this King Adonai Zedek, he gets them all together. He says, you know what? We've got to put all differences aside because you know what it's like These in, in a situation like that. They're not exactly friends. They're not exactly enemies. But they all got stuff against each other. And, you know, there was these little squabbles between them every once in a while about maybe a border that got moved and then it would get moved back. And so there was these, these border squabbles that would take place. But they never really fully engaged in warfare with each other. So King, this, this Adonai Zedek, he gathers these five, these, all, all five of these kings together and he says, you know what? We've got to put all of our differences aside for right now. We've got to band together to come into an agreement together to fight against this, this, this uh, threat from Israel so that they don't overrun us, so that they don't just come in and just take everything that we have. Wow. I'm going to tell you something. Right now, yes. November 21st, 21st. 2020, the enemy is scared. Yes. Mm. yes. You may not think it. You may not know it. He yeah. may not act like it. You might think it's us that's scared. You might think it's us that's on the run. You might think it's us that's initiating this conflict. I'm telling you, mm -mm. right now, the enemy is scared. Yep. Yes. I'll tell you why he's scared. He's scared. He's afraid. He's wetting his pants right now because there's a group of people that are meeting in a living room at 3255 East Western Reserve Road, Poland, Ohio, and he is afraid of you yes. because you're here. And he knows what kind of power exists and is happening in this room right now because he understands the authority that is coming against him. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Sad be the case. I think mean, he understands it sometimes more than we understand yep. it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of this stuff that you see happening in the news, and a lot of this stuff that 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 he keeps threatening with, a lot of it's smoke and mirrors. A lot of it's a lot of it is coming from the fact that he knows. What kind of power you have. Mm -hmm. And so he has thrown up smoke screens. And he's thrown up things like the coronavirus. And he's thrown up things like a false election. And he's thrown up all kinds of deceit and lies. And tried to convince you that you need to run and hide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, and the reason is, the same reason these five kings banded together... And had formed an alliance against the nation of Israel because they understood the threat of God's people. Yes. They knew the threat that was coming against their way of life. See, God has made some decrees. God has made, God has set some things down. And when God speaks something, when God says something, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. God is going to fulfill his word. His word never returns void. It never comes back empty. And the things that God has said about America, the things that God has said over your life are going to happen. It is the word of God. We're going to talk about that in a minute, about praying the Word of God. So, just like in the story here, the enemy has consolidated and has there have been alliances formed in the enemy's camp like we've never seen in our lifetime. That's right. I'm convinced of it. Yes. You see, the thing about Satan is, the thing about the enemy is, he's a liar. Yes. He lies. Yeah. He, he lives in deceit yep. and deception. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you're a liar, you lie to everybody. Yes. You lie to your friends as much as you lie to your enemies. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. When you live in deception, you deceive your friends as much as you deceive. It's, it's his nature to lie. It's his nature to be deceitful. Mm -hmm. So the problem that the enemy has is that his entire camp lives in a, in a, in a uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a, a sense of total, uh, almost uproar all the time. They're never at peace with each other because he doesn't understand peace. Satan doesn't know how to have peace. He doesn't know how to live it. He doesn't even like it. 
if somehow peace were to break out in the enemy's camp, he would destroy it because he doesn't like it. He doesn't want his, his, his followers, his uh, disciples, if you want to call them that, his, even his generals and his, his uh, soldiers, he doesn't want them getting along. He doesn't like it when they do. So there's this constant state of upheaval and uproar, and it's always on the verge of this revolution taking place. It's a horrible way to live. But because of the emergency, because of the threat of God's people, what happened then has happened now. There has been a there's been a, a almost a truce that's taking place between these between the forces of evil and and uh, within the within the the, the uh, uh, strongholds of the enemy. There's been a, a sort of a, a semi truce. It's never a full truce. It's never, it's, it's because these guys don't trust each other. They don't like each other. They, they're, they got, they've got history, and they never forgive. So even though they might come to, together like this, like these five kings came together to fight against the Israelites, they still didn't trust each other. They still didn't like each other. And so the whole time they were fighting with the Israelites or preparing for battle with the Israelites, these kings are thinking in the back of their mind and sort of like, okay, but what, you know, when we come out of this, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to get a foothold so I can get back at you for something that happened 30 years ago. When your grandpa shot my grandpa in the back, and so I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to use this opportunity wow. to to uh, uh, gain a foothold in this old conflict, even though right now you and I aren't gonna deal with this face to face. We gotta we gotta deal over here. So that's what was going on. So this this sense of of unity, this 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 truce, this. This uh, agreement that was signed be between these five kings was, it was, in a sense, it was binding, but it wasn't binding. Because the people that made this treaty lived in deception and fraud. Remember the Gibeonites? Remember that story? That was normal for them, that type of behavior, to, to use deception and fraud and deceit to get what they wanted. Mm. That's, how, that's how Satan operates. So, so that was, that was how all five of these kings, they were used to it. That was, they didn't know anything different. They didn't, they didn't understand anything at all about how God operates. But they, were un, they understood the threat, and so they come together. And they, they, these guys formed this alliance, and because Gibeon... Had, they looked at Gibeon as a traitor. They said, you know what? Let's go attack Gibeon. We don't dare attack the, the, the people of Israel. They're, they're too, right where they're at, they're too, uh, too embedded. They're too, like, we, we can't attack them, but we can attack Gibeon. So the five of them got together and they attacked Gibeon. And in verse 4, the Gibeonites... Uh, I'm sorry, that's in verse 4 is that, is that decision. He says, come up and help me attack Gibeon because it has made peace with Joshua. So the five kings in verse 5 attack. They take up positions against Gibeon and they're moving into position, these five kings, and they're surrounding Gibeon. So the Gibeonites are looking out over their walls and they're saying, oh man, we're in trouble now. We've, we've made all of these guys mad at us. They used to, I mean, we were already not friends. Now they're, they've completely... We, we're left out here on a limb. So they sent another delegation to Israel, and they said, you know what? We need your help. Verse 6, the Gibeonites sent a word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Gibeon sends out a call to their new friends, the Israelites. And because Joshua and the nation of Israel had signed an agreement, I want to point this out to you. God will use your mistakes. Yes. Yep. Just like he did here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So the Gibeonites were a mistake. They never should have signed that peace treaty. That was never part of what God wanted them to do. But because God is God, he can take everything 
and he does take everything mm -hmm. that happens, the good things we do and the bad things, mm -hmm. he will use your mistakes to get you to where he wants you to be. So, the Gibeonites call. And Joshua, look what it says. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army. I want you to look at that. With his entire army. They took everybody. Gibeonites called. Joshua, help. We're being attacked. All these kings are, there are against us. So Joshua, he gets every soldier, the entire army, including all the best fighting men. I'm going to talk about this for a minute. We are being called to war. We have been threatened. And it is time for the entire army of God to get involved. Mm -hmm. I like how he says it there in verse 7. He says the entire army was sent, was called up and said, let's go. We got a job to do, including the best fighting men. We got people in this room that have been fighting for years. They are seasoned veterans when it comes to fighting battles for God. There's people in here that have taught classes. They've issued badges. They have, <laughs> they, have, they have fought by themselves. They have fought on teams. They have conducted all-night prayer meetings. They have, they have uh, led prayer groups. They have fought the enemy on the right, on the left, in the middle, uh, behind them, and for them. They have fought. I'm telling you, there are seasoned veterans in this room that have been fighting almost their entire life. But there's some others in this room that have never really done it. But guess what? All of us are being called today. Yes. All of us are being called. Everyone, I don't care if you've never fought a battle for God. I'm going to teach you how in a few minutes. Come on. Because it doesn't matter when you fight God's way, whether you fought before, whether you're yeah. a seasoned veteran, or whether you're a, a, a rookie that's just starting out. Because there's people in this room that have been wakened up in just the last several months. And you have responded to the call of God in your life, mm -hmm. and, and and you've been like, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I just feel this this urgency in me to 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 uh, fight, and I don't know how. Well, I'm telling you, that's what it's all about. God is calling each one of us in this room to attack the enemy. Mm -hmm. So Joshua, in the in the army, says so they marched up from Gilgal. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Mm. Folks, I'm telling you, what the Ooh. enemy is trying to do right now is directly against what God has That's said. Right. Yeah. God has said that the, the, the United States of America is his country, is yes. one nation yes. under God. Yes. We stamped his name on our country, and he is not ready to give it up. Yes. And he is not going to give it up. Yeah. And the Truth. forces yes. that have Truth. come against our country right now that want to destroy Jesus. this country, the United States of America, are not going to prevail because they are against the divine will of sovereign God. Glory to God. Thank you. And he is calling us to fight that battle right now. Now, thank God we have a president in the White House yes. right now who is willing to take a stand, who has stood against the deception and the, and the lies and the deceit of the enemy that exists in Washington, D.C. and have permeated that entire 
that, that entire uh, mountain. He stands against the deception and the deceit of the media. He stands, yes, in, yes. He stands in defiance of the deception and the deceit of the entertainment industry. He stands in defiance of the deceit and the deception of the corporate world. He stands in, in defiance of the rest of the government. He stands in defiance and, de and, 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 and will not bow to the educational uh, Industry, and you realize I just named five kings. Yes. Wow. Yes. Thank Because that's what we're fighting against. Yes. That is the stronghold of the enemy. Now here's the deal. Look at what it says. Verse nine. This is important. After so Gideon or Joshua sets out. With the knowledge, with the knowledge, the knowing, the faith, the belief that the enemy has already been delivered into his hand. Mm -hmm. With the knowledge that the word of God has gone out, has been issued, has been spoken. The divine will of God has been decreed. Mm -hmm. I have given him into your hand. So Joshua sets out with the entire army, every person in the room, mm -hmm. the rookies and the seasoned veterans. Yep. Look what it says in verse 9. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. I want to talk to you about that all-night march. We're going to have to learn to fight at night. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you know when I get my best sleep? It's at night. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know when it's the most peaceful? It's at night. You know when I'm supposed to be at rest? It's at night. You know when I'm not supposed to be doing anything at all? It's at night. But guess what? God is calling us yes, yes, yes. out of our rest. Yes. Yes. Think yes. about the yes. fact that yes. the yes. church has been called out of its slumber. Yeah. Yes. It's been called out of its night. Yes. It's been wakened up. The church for a long time has been in a repose. It's been it's been it's like it's been like in the evening time. They're they're like sitting back just sort of chilling out and resting. Mm -hmm. But God said, "No, no, 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 no. It's time for my church mm -hmm. to go to battle." And so he has wakened his church. Now it's true, the church is not as big as we thought it was. It's not as we don't have the numerical uh numbers that we thought we had because we used to think the church was anybody that called themselves Christian was anybody that, 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 that hung that label on themselves but what we found out in 2020, 2020 the year of perfect vision, one of the things that God showed us with this new vision is that you know what, the church wasn't nearly as big or as powerful as we thought it was in fact, there was a lot of slackers in the church. There was a lot of pretenders. There was a lot of people that were just going along with the program. They weren't really involved in God's work at all. They were just there to suck up and enjoy the fruits of that labor, of, of, of that. So one of the things that's happened is the church has been whittled down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Because the true church, the real bride of Christ, is the remnant. It's the people in this room. Now, I know, I know, there's other living rooms all across the country right now. I don't know who they are, I don't know where they are, but I, I know they're out there. But they are not relevant to what's going on here today. That's God's business. He is rising up his remnant, his bride, his warrior bride, to fight in this battle. But he's saying, you gotta, you got to march all night. If you're going to fight in this battle, you're going to have to give up some things. Mm -hmm. Might be sleep. Might be food. Yeah. Might be material things. Mm -hmm. Might be your dream. Might be something else. Because God is saying, this battle that's coming is the battle that's going to, that's going to set the table for the entire thing. I don't know if we're going to get to the end, so I want to tell you what's what the end before we get there. If you look all the way down at the end of, of uh, chapter 10, it says, Joshua 
subdued from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings in their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. As a result of this all-night march that, this, that the, the army went on, as a result of them giving up their sleep. Now understand something about all-night marches. They're not fun. Especially back in, in this day. Now we have GPSs, we got lights, we got super highways, we've got uh, all kinds of things that would make it almost easy to, to conduct an all night march. They didn't have any of that stuff back then. They had to march an entire army in secrecy. So that means they couldn't make any noise. There was no, there was no cadence counts. There was no uh, yelling back and forth. Hey, you guys over there, catch up, you're falling behind. And they had to be secret. They had to be quiet because they were sneaking into position. They were moving into position to fight a battle in the morning. The enemy was all camped out around the Gibeonites. They thought, oh, we got this easy. The Gibeonites are afraid of us. They, 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 they're not going to be able to hold out. We've got this battle. So they were all sleeping in their tents. They were all resting up because they were going to attack at dawn the next morning. They were going to launch their attack against the Gibeonites. Little did they realize that Joshua and his army were sneaking up behind them in the middle of the night. And sneaking they were. So Joshua and his army, think about this, maybe a million strong or more. These men were sneaking about in the middle of the night. No lights, no talking, no noise. Had to keep their weapons uh, quiet. Couldn't rattle their swords. Couldn't, couldn't be yelling commands back and forth. Everything had to be done in secrecy. So think about what it was like to march all night. And you will get some idea of what God is calling you to right now. He is calling you to march at night. To pray at night. God is going to start waking some of you up at night to pray when you should be when you think you ought to be sleeping. And you're going to wake up and you're going to be laying in bed staring at the ceiling wondering why can't I sleep? Well, God's just telling you I need you to get up and pray. I need you to march all night. I because I got a battle coming. And I need you to be there. It's not easy to be one of God's warriors. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you. It's going to involve you giving up some things. It's going to involve you marching all night. When it's not comfortable. When you march at night, you stub your toe some. And it hurts. But we have got to march at night. Yes. Why? Because that's where the battle's at. So look at verse 10. After this all-night march, Joshua took them by surprise. And because of their all-night march, it says the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gideon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road, now watch this. Mm -hmm. As they fled before Israel on the road, down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them. Hallelujah. And more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. God is getting ready to send some hail. On election night. On election night. I was driving my truck up Route 170. Uh, no, it was the night before election. I'm sorry. It was the, on, uh, the evening before the election. So this would have been November 2nd. I was working. I was driving my truck up 170. And I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, I heard God tell me, he said, release the pounding angels. I had no idea what pounding angels were. Didn't know what they were, but God told me, and I spoke it. I said, I release the pounding angels. The pounding angels. The pounding angels. I didn't know I was talking about angels and hailstorms. So Joshua... And his army march all night. The marching all night 
is you coming into alignment with what God is doing. So you think, you wondering, why do I got to pray at night? Why do, I, why do I have to fast? Why do I have to give up food? Why do I have to give up television? Why is it in the middle of a, in the middle of a Hallmark movie, all of a sudden God tells me, I want you to shut that off and pray for a little while. Why is it in the middle of a good book that you're reading, all of a sudden God says, I need you to lay that down. I need you to pray for an hour. Why is, it, I, why is it God saying, I need you to give this up or give that up? Why is it in the middle of a conversation, somebody with, on the phone, God will tell you, you know what, I need you to hang up now because I need you to come pray. Because that's what marching all night is. It's you praying, it's you coming into alignment with God when it's not comfortable for you. When you think I ought to be doing something else. But guess what, after that all night march, you will be where God is at. See, God was getting ready to do something. He was getting ready to rout these five kings. He was getting ready to do damage to these people. And he needed his people to be where he was going to do this damage. As I was reading this, I'm picturing God up in heaven, him and the angels make snowballs out of hailstones. I don't know how big of a hailstone you need to kill a man. But it has to be a pretty good size. It has to be bigger than any hail I've ever seen. I mean, I wouldn't want to be out in the kind of hail we get around here. You see these little hailstones that may be that big around, and they would hurt. And I guess if you got hit with enough of them, eventually they'd kill you. But when I, talk, when I hear this story and I read this story, I picture God making big old nasty hailstones. And I picture God throwing them things at those, at those enemies, those five kings and their armies running along out in the open. They've already, uh, they've already been confused. They've already come together and there is this atmosphere of sort of trust, semi-trust, not trust. And they're like looking at each other and like, okay, we're going to fight here, but I'm watching you. And, you know, you try to fight and watch your back at the same time. You're not going to get much done. And that's, so they were already there. And in the middle of that, right when they're getting ready to launch their major offensive, they finally got everybody on the same track. And all of a sudden, right when they're getting ready to step out towards the enemy, they hear a, they hear a, a, a trumpet sound behind them. And they turn around. There's the entire army of Israel. <laughs> Because they marched all night, and they are in the will of God, and they are right where God wants them to be. And God throws them into confusion. Yes. All of their treaties, all of their, all of their talking, it all goes out the window. And they turn, and they run, and they, they're running into each other, and they're stabbing each other, and they're killing each other. And it's confusion and mass chaos. And they just take out all across the fields. And can you imagine, you're running and you're looking behind you. What's, you don't even know what's chasing you. Yeah. And you're running across this field and all of a sudden, you see the guy that's up ahead of you and all of a sudden, this big old hailstone comes out of nowhere and bam, he's dead. <laughs> and you look over to the right and another big old hailstone just bam. And you're out in the middle of the field. There's nothing to hide under. There's nowhere to go. That's what it was like for the enemy. Now here's the thing. That's how I pictured it. I always pictured God in heaven. You know, God is angels sitting there. And he says, hey, guys, make me another stone. And he throws it at the enemy. The truth is, I don't think that's what happened. You know what I think? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not definitely not quoting scripture on this. I think God had planned that hailstone, that hailstorm, a long time ago. Yep. Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes a it takes a while to form a hailstorm. It takes a while to, to form hail, and especially stones big enough to kill a man. Mm -hmm. It would take a while. Now, I'm not saying God couldn't mm -hmm. build them and throw them. Not, it, maybe he did. I don't. I think. I think. The hailstorm was set in motion long before the battle took place, before the night march. I think God 
made everything happen to get the enemy out in that open field because that's where the hail was going to come. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I think. See, the problem with a, a, a message like this, when you get a call like this from God and he says, I want you to come fight, we have a tendency to think, oh, well, if I don't, it's, in, it's important that I fight or we won't win. That's not the truth. Because God can win without us. He doesn't need us to win the battle. I think, I think the battle has been decided. I think God has decided who's going to, I told you, God said, and when God said, there's no, there's no backtracking off of that. It's not up in the air. So why the all-night march? Why is it so important for me to pray when I should be sleeping or pray when I should be eating or pray when I want to watch a movie? Why the all-night march? Because God wants you to be where he's at. He's bringing us into alignment with something he already has ordained and set forth. The enemy is going down. He is going down. That has been decided. That has been determined. The question is, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? Because you look at, we look at a battle like this and we think, oh, i got to give up so much. And we should be thinking, oh, but I get to be there. I get to be involved. I get to have not just a front row seat, but I actually get to be involved in the battle that's going to determine the fate of a country. The fate of the world. I get to be a part of that. Yes. So when God calls you and says, I need you, to, I need you to march all night. I need you to get up and pray. I need you to fight in the spirit realm. Mm-hmm. Then it's not, it's not uh, a sacrifice. It's a privilege. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because he's got a hailstorm coming. Mm-hmm. And the pounding angels mm-hmm. are coming. I'm going to tell you, I told you this is a shotgun sermon. Here's the deal. You can't fight. We're not going to get to the throat punching part. Oh. <laughs> because, well, I'll just share it with you real quick. I'm not going to, I'm going to read it. But. So, so they, they have this battle, and as the enemy's fleeing, and as they're in confusion, and as they're running across the field, and the hailstones are dropping on them, and, and men are being decimated. I love it. The, the, the hailstones killed more than, this, than the Sword. soldiers did. Mm-hmm. That's a powerful thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So while all of this is going on, the Israelites are just, I mean, they're having the time of their life. Mm-hmm. They're winning, and they're winning, and they're winning. Well, in the middle of all that, Joshua and his men discover that these five kings have hidden in a cave. Mm-hmm. And they, they come to this cave, and, and the, the, somebody comes to Joshua and says, hey, these five kings are all... It, hiding in this cave, what should we do? And Joshua says, well, listen, we don't have time to deal with them right now. He said, just cover the mouth of the cave over because they can't get out. And he says, and, and let's go pursue the enemy and we'll go deal with the army and then we're going to come back and deal with these guys. And that's what they did. And so what they, they, they go out and they kill the armies. They, they wipe out the enemies. And, it, and one of the things that says there were no survivors. God, it was a decimation. It was a a complete and total victory for God's people. And then Joshua and his men come back to the cave and they pull the, the rocks. And this is a condensed version. They, they pull the rocks off of that, that, that cave and they bring those five kings out who, who they're not so powerful now. Why? Because their, 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 uh, their power has been decimated. And so they're no longer powerful kings. Now they're just, a, they're just five guys. Probably opened up a hamburger joint. <laughs> so these five guys who are no longer kings, Joshua brings them out and he gathers his, his army around him and he tells him, he says, come here guys, I want you to put your f- foot on the throat. God's calling us to be throat punchers. Throat punchers. Because the throat, is one of the most vulnerable places on the body. If you want to hurt a man or a woman, if you want to damage somebody with the least amount of effort, punch them in the throat. You can kill a, you can kill a person real easy. Why? Because the, the throat is completely vulnerable. There's very little, there's no bones there. The, the, the 
voice box, the air passages, they're all right there. And if you karate chop somebody right there, bam, they're dead. You know, they're, they're down. No matter how big they are, that part of the body is completely vulnerable. That's why Joshua, he brought his, his enemy around and he said, guys, we're going to throat punch. We're putting these guys to death. We're not letting them up. It was, a, it was a vulnerability to the enemy. God is getting ready, and he's got the hailstones in place, and the enemy is going down. And you have a chance to be a throat puncher, to put your foot on the throat of the enemy. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and this is very, very, very important. You can't do that in the physical realm. You cannot do it in the physical realm. You can only fight like this in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn to fight in the spirit realm. Yes. Because yes. it's the only place where you can yes. be a throat puncher. Mm -hmm. It's the only place where you can attack the enemy. I'll tell you real quick. There's four kinds of people. There's the enemies of God. There's, there's neutrals. There's warriors. And there's captains. I don't have time to... One of these days I'm going to preach this sermon. God gave it to me a long time ago. But... But it's these neutrals that cause all the problems in the physical realm. The neutrals are the people that we're not sure if they're the enemies or if they're our friends. They're neutrals. They, they haven't made up their mind. They've been deceived. I don't know what makes a neutral. I will tell you this. God never calls somebody to be a neutral. If you're, if you're a child of God, then he has called you to be a warrior and maybe a captain. Not all warriors are captains. All captains are warriors, but not all warriors are captains. Mm -hmm. And by the way, captains aren't, aren't uh, they're not more special or more important or more valuable than, than uh, warriors are. That's, there's so much there, I don't have time. Uh, but God never called anybody to be a neutral. But the problem is when you try to fight in the physical... In the physical realm, we got all these neutrals running around. We got to be careful of the neutrals. Come on, you have to. You can't just go around throat punching yeah. people. Because I might look at Michael and think he's the enemy. Bam! And I take him out with a throat punch. But he might not be the enemy. Maybe I misunderstood him. Maybe I maybe I read him wrong. Maybe maybe he was a neutral. Maybe I maybe I was wrong. But I just I just hurt an innocent man by doing that. You can't throat punch in the physical realm. You've got to be careful. In the physical realm, we have to practice restricted warfare. That means we can't unleash all of our powerful weapons in the physical realm because there's too many innocent people that could get hurt. In the spirit realm, there are no neutrals. They don't go there. They don't go there. In the, spi in the spirit realm, there's, either, there's only enemies and there's God. So in the spirit realm, when you see an enemy, bam, you can take them out. Mm -hmm. You can unleash a hailstone on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's so much here. We can't fight this in the physical realm. That's been the problem. That's been the mistake that the church has made. Mm -hmm. Is we've been trying to fight this battle in the physical realm when we should have been fighting in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not against, I'm not against uh, doing the things in the physical realm that you can do. I'm not against the church's, uh, 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 God help me, uh, I'm not against the church's programs. Mm -hmm. I'm not against food closets and outreaches and youth groups and children's church and, and, and all these social outreaches. They're all good things. And I'm not saying you should quit doing those things. I'm not, I'm not speaking against those things. But what I'm saying is we've got to do both. And the yes. thing that we have not been doing is we have not been fighting in the spirit realm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn to fight in the spirit realm. Here's the thing about, about this. And I, and I hope you, I asked these two ladies to sit beside each other. Judy and Tammy. I'll tell you why. They're as opposite to me as night and day. 
<laughs> there's every, everything, like everything about them is completely yeah. the opposite. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, Judy is one of Cindy and I's oldest and dearest friends. She, we've known her for uh, 25, 27 years, almost 30 years. She is a, 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 just an old, dear friend of ours. Tammy, I've only known for a couple months. How long have you been coming here? Sure. So, yeah. yeah. I love mm -hmm. both of them. I want to ask you guys a question. We, since Tammy has been coming here, I know the answer to this. <laughs> since Tammy has been coming here, we have never held a meeting in this living room when Tammy was here that she did not speak. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm serious. We're, we're, we're keeping track, Tammy. No, we're not, we're not keeping track. <laughs> but I will tell you, it's always been good. Absolutely. It's always yeah, been good. And yeah, it's been absolutely. powerful. And it's yes, been yeah. life changing. Yeah. And, and, and we have yeah. gotten stuff from what you've said. Mm -hmm. And we do not want you to change. Yeah. So, so for, for two months, er, the first time she was here, she spoke. I remember. You didn't say a lot. Not much, yeah. not much but you spoke. Yeah. And it was powerful. And it was powerful. So, mm -hmm. but every, she, if I told her, if I asked her, I said, Tammy, could you please not speak? She couldn't. <laughs> she had to sit outside. Yeah, she'd, have to, she'd have to, we'd have to tape her mouth shut and tie her hands to the chair. And then she'd be kicking with her feet and not out of God knows. So, I learned slide language. So, yeah. So, but, so, so that's her. But let me ask you this question. Out of all of the, the whole length of time that Judy has been coming here, how many times have you heard her speak? She never speaks. Now, I learned a long, long, long time ago to never compare people. Right. Yeah. And never, that's a, that's a horrible, terrible yes. mistake to make. Not only is it stupid, but it is, is dangerous mm -hmm. to do it. So I would never, ever compare these two women. They're both powerful mm -hmm. in their own right. That's right. But they're different. They're different. But here's the thing. It's easy for us because we have heard Tammy's words, and her words are powerful. Mm -hmm. And I could have used others in this room. I could have used people instead of Tammy and people instead of Judy because some of you, it's almost like we can almost d divide, divide up the room, room and have the yeah. quiet in the talkers, you know. <laughs> and, but here's the thing. Judy is a, a force in her own right. If you, if you knew what I know about her, you would know what I'm talking about. I don't time to share her testimony. It's a powerful, powerful testimony. She's a woman of God. She's a woman of great power. A woman of great uh, honor and integrity and decency. And she's a powerful woman in her own right. Now, just because she doesn't say, by the way, I asked her not to speak today. I told her, I, asked, I, told her, I said, I'm going to use you. And she says, as long as I don't have to speak. I said, what I need you to do. It's not say a word. I didn't have to ask Tammy anything. I just asked her to sit here. I knew she would speak. I knew she would say something. I didn't even say anything to her. Judy, I wanted to make sure she didn't speak today because I thought, what a perfect sermon illustration. All of a sudden, this would be the day that Judy would like, like have a like, word of knowledge or something. So I asked her not to speak. So she's not speaking. But I'm telling you, they're both powerful, powerful ladies of God. And everybody in this room, whether you're a speaker or a non-speaker, whether you're a Tammy or a Judy or something in between, I'm telling you, God is calling you to battle today. He's calling you to fight. He's calling you to march all night. He's calling you to be a powerful force. He's calling you to call down thunder from heaven. Come on. And he's calling you. And you. And you. And all of us. Why? Because he's getting ready to send the hail. Come on. And you want to be there. Yes. I don't care what it costs you. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to be in the wrong place when this happens. Because God is getting ready to unleash something that we've never seen in our lifetime. 
It looks bad right now. It looks like the, the people of God are on the run. It looks like the, the it looks like the enemy is ready to overwhelm us. It looks like we have elected an idiot for a president. It looks like we have elected a retard for a vice president. It looks like they're calling them president and vice president elect. But God has not said that yet. God has not declared it. Let me tell you something else that you might not realize. There is a price on your head today. Yes. You might think that you're going to ride this out, that you're just going to sit on the fence and see which way the wind's blowing. But I'm telling you, there is a price on your head. Just like in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, when Daniel, when the king had the dream, and he told the, the, the wise men at the council, he said, if you guys tell me your, my dream, then I will give you great glory. But if you don't tell me my dream and what it means, I'm putting you all to death. And so the edict, the word went out. The decree had been made. And, and, and they came and found Daniel, and the, the guy said, look it, sorry guys, i got to put you to death. Daniel says, what did we do? And, then, and, they, and the guy said, well, the king had a dream, and nobody can tell him what the dream was and what the dream means. So the king's just, de he's declared, he's decreed, the edict has gone out. You all have to die. You know what Daniel did? He called his friends together, and he said, guys, we're going to march all night. We're going to march all night. And they did, and they prayed. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, in the night, in the night, just like in Joshua, in the night, the dream, the vision came to Daniel. And Daniel was able to save his own life. When Esther, in the book of Esther, chapter 4, we all know the story of Esther. We all know that Esther was put there for such a time as this. But you know the part of the story that gets overlooked sometimes? is when the edict went out. The word had gone out from the king. The decree had been made. All of God's people got to die. And Haman had tricked the king. And the deceit and the lies that had all been planted in just such a way so that the king would sign the edict and the decree. And the word had gone out that all God's people had to be put to death. And Mordecai came to Esther and said, Esther, you've got to do something. You're the queen. You have an audience with the king. He can, you, can, you can change the course of history. You can, you can be the, the, the right arm of God. You can be the voice of God right now. And Esther sent back a reply to the king. And, and she said, well, I'm not sure I'll succeed. I don't know if I can do it. I'm not, I don't know what the king will do if I just go in there. And, and so Esther told Mordecai, she said, you need to get all of God's people, the entire army, army, all of the people in Susa, all of God's people, and they got to pray and fast for three days. They marched all night. They marched all night. And then Esther went before the king. But it was that all night march that we forget about that we sometimes lose, lose focus of. Because we look at Esther, I'm telling you, we might not have an Esther in this room. I don't know if the person that is going to change the course of history in, is in this room. But I'm telling you this, we are the people that God is calling to march all night. To fight in the spirit realm. You're saying, well, how do I do that? I don't know. I, I, I've never done it before. This is, this is oversimplified, and you might not think that some of you that have been fighting forever, you've got, you've got prayers, and you've got methods, and you've got training, and you've got, you, you might not understand that but there's people that don't know how to do it, so I'm going to tell you how to do it. You pray the Word of God. Yes. It's yes. that simple. Yes. You pray the Word of God. Mm. You say, but I don't know the Word of God. Then get a Bible, look it up, and read it. The prayer part comes when you come into agreement with that prayer. There are already prayers written out for you. Yep. All you got to do is read them and make them your own. Yep. And speak them. And you pray speak them. The word speak them out. Pray them out. Yep. But the start with Jesus. When the disciples came to Jesus, they said, Jesus, 
We, we see you pray. We see what is accomplished by you praying. And they said to Jesus, teach us to pray. You know that was one of the only times that they ever asked Jesus to teach them anything? Yes. They saw Jesus heal a man. They saw Jesus heal many. They saw Jesus raise a man from the dead. They didn't ask Jesus, sh sh teach us how to do that. They didn't ask Jesus, teach us how to preach, teach us how to teach, teach us how to prophesy, teach us how to... They didn't ask Jesus. You know what they asked Jesus? One of the only things they ever asked him was they came to Jesus and said, we want to know how to pray. Here's how you do it. In the spirit realm. In the spirit realm. You pray the word of God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I discovered something this week. I never really prayed the Lord's Prayer very much. In fact, I never liked it. You know why? Because it it got turned into a poem. It got turned into a song, actually, several of them. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But it always annoyed me. It always annoyed me whenever there would be a, a group of people and, and there would be this mix of some God's people, some not God's people, and I never knew if they, if they even knew God. And somebody would say, well, let's save the Lord's Prayer. And everybody would stand up and recite that. It always annoyed me. It always bothered me. And as a result of that, because I knew how to pray. I knew how to pray my own words. I learned how to pray when I was a kid. I learned how to pray in this living room. I learned how to pray from watching my dad kneel in his chair and pray. Come on. So I knew how to pray. But this week, I discovered how to pray the Lord's Prayer again. Because as, as, I, was, as I was marching through the night, as I was praying in the night, it dawned on me, I can pray the Lord's Prayer. And I started to pray that prayer. Yes. Everybody, almost, I bet everybody in the room can recite that prayer. You don't even need to look that one up. If you, if you run out of power with that one, then go to Psalms chapter 3. There's all kinds of prayers in the Psalms that King David prayed yes. when he was being overrun by his enemies. Yes. Go find them. And if you can't think of words to say, and you don't know how to pray in the Spirit, maybe you don't have a very powerful prayer language, and it's hard for you to do it, then get you a Bible, read those prayers, and just come into agreement and make those prayers your worst. Yes. Why? Because it's marching all night, and it will bring you into alignment, and it will put you in the place where you can be part of history. I told you the edict has gone out, the decree has gone out, and it has your name on it. You think, I am not kidding you. If, if somehow the enemy could win what is going on in our country right now, if they get control, if they get power, we have been decreed to die. And I'm not talking figuratively. I am talking in reality. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I know. I know they talk peace. And they say that we're going to bring the country together. They are not going to bring the country together. They have no interest in letting us live. And the edicts, the decrees, have been drawn up. And they have been signed as we speak they're being drawn up. These people that have been so-called voted into power, if they get power, once they have it, if they were able to get it, I'm telling you, your name is on a death warrant. I never understood this year why it was so important for me to vote. It's always been important for me to vote. I've always felt like it was my civic duty. It was my, my responsibility. It was my great privilege. It was my freedom. I've always understood that from a physical sense, that, that, that voting was an important thing. This year was different. 
this year there was an urgency yes. in me, a, a driving that yes. I absolutely had to vote. And I, I will tell you, I voted for Trump. I had to vote, and that's who I had to vote for. There was no, there was no way out. My wife and I felt this. She felt the same way. And I talked to others that had this this strong urgency to vote this time. And I kept, I kept saying, why, 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 God, why, do, why is it so critical this time that I vote? And, and uh, I was talking to God about this uh, several weeks before the election, and he told, this is all he told me. I don't know why yet. I don't know all the reasons, but he did tell me this. This is the only thing he told me. He said, because the votes have been recorded. The votes have been recorded. I don't know... I, I don't know if he means they're recorded in heaven. I think it could mean that. But I also think that he means the votes have been recorded physically. Yes. Mm -hmm. You might not like it. You might not agree with me. But I'm telling you, the government knows who you voted for. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I know it's supposed to be secret. I know no. nobody's supposed to know. I know that's mm -hmm. supposed to be one of our sort of sacred uh, rights and but I'm telling you these people the, the the forces of Satan have no interest in our rights no. Amen. No. and that one is no more sacred or precious to them than anything else and they know who you voted for and they will not let it stand Michelle Obama t tweeted she said we know who you are and we're coming after you. Nancy Pelosi, a couple years ago, said, we're not going to forget. We're not going to forget. She said, when we get power, we're not going to forget. Wow. You think. You think that you're riding the fence. You think, well, nobody's going to care about little old me. I'm just... I'm just a girl or a guy in a living room someplace. I'm telling you, you're in the crosshairs. You might think, oh, I don't need to march all night. Then you're going to die. I want to show you this, because this is... Get me my, my stuff. Some of you have seen the part of this rodeo before, so don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. I don't get help here from my trusty assistant. This is the this is the uh, illustration that God gave me. I've been talking about these five kings. This is why we moved the coffee table because I wanted you to see this. These are the five kings that God showed me. We have five, and, and there might be more, so don't quibble with me on the number. The only reason God gave me five is because of Brenda's five kings. Some people say seven, others say more, and, I'm, and we're not going to cover them all, but I'm going to give you five, what I believe are the enemy strongholds in our country right now. This one, let's just say... I'm going to call this the media. Our media is filled with corruption and deception and lies. We get lied to every day by the yep. media. There's no truth anymore. No, no. The media is corrupt. It's 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 just vile and disgusting. This is uh, corporate America. Big business. They didn't even have to be a corporation, but I'm talking about big business. <coughs> big business in America is corrupt. But there's a ton of money in it. And there's power in it. And it's corrupt. It's full of corruption. Now listen, I'm not saying everybody in these industries is corrupt or, or even, I'm saying because there's good people right. within these industries, within these areas. But overall, as a as a uh, group, they become a stronghold for Satan. This is the entertainment industry. You know, we, 
I'm not even going to talk about that because we all know how corrupt that is. It, they've been blatantly destroying their corruption for ever. But it's gone unchecked. It's gone unfought against. So we've got the media, we've got corporate America, and we've got entertainment. This is our government. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know which one of these areas is more corrupt. Come on. It's all disgusting. It's all the corruption and the deceit, and, and, the, and the, they've all become enemy strongholds. And they are, they are, they are, by themselves, they're destroying our country, our, car, our, our culture, our society. But this is the one, this is the Mac Daddy. I believe, I believe that's the biggest one. And I believe that's the ultimate stronghold of the enemy. That's the education. Oh, and the mm -hmm. oh yes. Now, I'm not going to, if you think one of these other ones might be more powerful, I know I don't have health care in there. I know I don't have some other areas that are strongholds of the enemy. But God gave me these five. And they are strongholds of the enemy. And I believe what's happened, I believe this is happening. And, and actually, within our lifetime probably it's happened for sure. But there has been a, just like those five kings. There's been a, a like an inner, Scott, I can just set this down. There's been a, 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 an alliance formed mm -hmm. and a, like a protection. That's why I put these four outside because I believe that the enemy will do when, when this all starts to come unraveled and unravel is going to come. I think these four will sacrifice themselves to save this one because I think that's the ultimate enemy stronghold. I'm, I'm not saying that prophetically. I'm not saying that's the word of God. I'm just saying that's my opinion. It's what I think. I think, I think, I think that's where Satan will fight. That's where he'll make his last stand in our country. He's going, to, he's going to fight to keep that one. Why? Because it's the gateway to the future. Now, there's several things about all of these areas. Every one of these areas, they have influence great, great deal of influence with the population of the people of our country. Think about how many people are controlled by their boss or by their job. And what they're told and, and the information they get that comes down from that. Think about the, the power that the media has. Mm -hmm. Think about the power that the entertainment industry has. Now, out of all of these, that's the one I understand the least because I can't understand why anybody would give them power. I can't understand why anybody would buy a Buick because that's what Tiger Woods drives. I can't understand why you would buy a pair of shoes because LeBron James says that's what he wears. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it, but it's part of our culture. Mm -hmm. These people have tremendous power. They have tremendous influence, especially with young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. doesn't make sense to me, but it's there. And it's a stronghold of the enemy. Our government obviously has influence over our lives. They make laws. They pass decrees. They, they, they make uh, all kinds. They can do just about anything. When they've got tremendous power. And God knows what goes on in the education industry. Talk to Amy. Talk to Sue. Talk to Sarah. They've all taught. They're all teachers. They know. They they. You talk to any teacher that has ever taught in a, in a public education system, and you know what goes on there and what's being taught. This is the stronghold of the enemy. This is what we're fighting against. This is, what is, this is the threat to our very existence as the church of God. Now, unfortunately, here's what the church has been going against it. These are the weapons that the church has been using to come against these enemy strongholds. These are the these are the 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 things that the church has been doing. We've been building these ministries, and we have big, impressive buildings, and we've got programs, and we've got uh, all these things going on. And we launch those things at the enemy, 
and nothing happens because these weapons have absolutely no power against these forces of the enemy. And we, so that's what, that's our, that's our, that's the church's weapon right there. And so while we've been building huge, big uh, ministries, Amen. And they've been they've been having these yeah. wonderful programs. And again, I'm not against the programs. I'm not right. saying they have their place. I'm not saying we should do away with them. <laughs> but what I'm saying is when it comes to a battle like we're facing right now, it's like launching ping pong balls at at, at indestructible force. Right. Because while we've been building these ministries, while they've been growing large and and and, and Christians have been getting fat. On, on those things and and uh, we have all these programs the satanic strongholds have just been getting stronger and stronger and stronger and and now we find ourselves on the brink of destruction because we forgot how to fight what is it you say Tammy we've given up the Holy Spirit for a marketing plan, plan. Yeah. that's your marketing plan right there you got it in your hand Throw your marketing plan at the at the at the mm -hmm. thing. Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing. I'm going to show you what happens when you march on that. When you learn how to pray. And I don't care if you're Tammy. I don't care if you're Judy. Judy. <laughs> This is the power of God. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to show you what's going to happen. Yeah. When you pray on your knees. Mm -hmm. When you start crying out to God, mm -hmm. even if it's not your own prayers. Come on. Right. Our Father, yes. which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Yes. On earth as it is in heaven. Yes. Thy will be done. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Give us this day our daily bread. Father God. Father God. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the power. And the glory forever. Because this is what God has decreed for the enemy. Love it. Folks, God has spoken it. Come on. God has decreed it. The enemy is on the run. Yes. 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 Some of you have seen this rodeo before. Well, guess what? So has the enemy. Yep. So has the enemy. He knows. He knows no matter how many alliances he makes. He knows no matter how many decrees he makes, no matter how many, how many laws he passes. This is the power of God. Yep. And when you come into alignment, when you march all night, when you pray all night, when you pray when you want to be sleeping, when you pray when you want to be eating, when you pray when you may be watching a movie, when you pray when you want to be reading a book, when you want to pray when you want to be talking to a friend, when you pray all night, when you come into alignment with him, this is what you come into alignment with. Because it don't matter how many of those little blocks the enemy stacks up. He's no match for the ultimate power of God. When you come in to that, you release the pound yes. of angels. Yes. You yes. release the hailstones. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. You're never going to defeat the enemy on your own. And for sure, you're never going to defeat him if all you're doing is fighting in the flesh and fighting in the physical realm. But when you learn how to fight in the spirit realm, 
And when you learn how to pray the word of God, and when you learn how to speak truth, you will become invincible. Yep. I don't care if you're one person, if we're two people, if we're three. Wherever two or three are gathered together, wherever two or three are gathered in unity, whenever two or three come into agreement, we unleash the most destructive power in hell. The power of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's what God's calling us to today. You might think that you've never fought before. You might think that, well, my gift lies somewhere else. I'm not talking about your gift. I'm not talking about what you've done before. I'm not talking about your position or your title or your 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 ministry or your your uh, anything else. I'm talking about you being called by God yes. to fight because you're part of the army. Yes. And the whole army is being called out. Mm -hmm. When Esther had to go, she called all of the Christians, all of the Israelites, all of the Jews that were living in Susa. And they prayed all night. Mm -hmm. And they prayed without ceasing. Why? Because they were facing an enemy mm -hmm. that was bigger than them. I told you the enemy's on the run. The enemy is scared. The enemy is frightened right now. He's not frightened of you mm -hmm. because you, all you got is ping pong ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What he's afraid of and what he knows is coming is he knows that God has already called you and that you have answered the call and you're getting ready to march all night and he can't stop you. He can pass all the laws he wants about Pennsylvania coming into Ohio and Ohio coming into Pennsylvania and Michigan and so forth and so on. He can pass all the laws he wants and decrees and, and mandates that says we're not allowed to have Thanksgiving, we're not allowed to have Christmas and we're not allowed to meet together, we're not allowed to do this and we're not allowed to do that. He can do all that he wants. He's no match for the power of God. He knows it. He is on the run. And they're living in fear right now. You can hear it in their, in their voices. You can hear it. But we got to march all night. We got to pray. We got to pray. And you can't wait till somebody calls an all night prayer meeting. You can't wait for, for somebody else to call you and say, hey, we're all praying. Why don't you come over and join us? You got to do this on your own. We got to, we got to meet together separately. We got yeah. to, we've got to come together in unity, but we've also got to do it on our own. When they marched all night, there was no communication. There couldn't be because they were doing it in secret. They were, they were having to go at night and they were doing it quietly. So there was nobody calling and saying, hey, you guys line up over here. And, you know, usually when an army marches, there's a, there's a drum beat and there's a, a cadence that goes along with it to keep everybody marching in order and in line. And, and, and there's, you know, it's a great big noisy uh, pr procession. But when you do it at night, when you're sneaking into position to launch a surprise attack on the enemy, you do it quietly. You do it without that organization, without that structure. And that's what we have to do. We have to pray without that. I'm not saying we can't have it, but if we don't have it, it doesn't keep us yeah. from being what we're Come supposed on. to yeah. be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't wait for a pastor to do this. You can't wait for a deacon to lead the way. You can't wait for a Sunday school teacher. You can't wait for somebody to stand up and preach a sermon on it. You can't even rely on the internet. You can't rely on anything except what's in your heart. Our Father, with who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yes. Your kingdom come. Your yes. kingdom come. Yes. Your will be done. Yes. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. On earth. On earth. Yeah. In the United States. Yeah. Yes. Yes. As it is, as you already decreed in heaven, as you set it up. Let it be like that on earth. You know, the truth is, I can't hardly get through the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. 
Because every time I get to that part, I just get hung up on it. Yes. I get hung up on, on that part right there. Uh -huh. On earth. As you decreed it. As you said it. As you spoke it. Amen. Let it be on earth. Never got it. How much power is in that in that prayer? Yeah. If you don't like it, find another one. Yeah. Pray your own words. Whatever God puts on your heart. Mm -hmm. Some of you, some of you will be like Sarah. Sarah prays. She stands up and stomps her foot and claps her hands and waves her arms and she does all kinds of stuff. That's fine. Some of you might not feel led to pray that way. She doesn't pray that way all the time. Sometimes she does. I've, I've seen her pray. Her and I go way back at, in prayer. I mean, we have a history of, of praying together. I've seen her do all kinds of strange things in prayer. It's just how God leads her. She prays it. It's all fine. Some of you aren't going to pray like that. Some of you are going to be like Marilyn. Marilyn just prays quietly. That's fine. There's no, you don't, you don't have more power by speaking loudly. Mm -hmm. You might just need to be like Tammy and speak loudly. <laughs> she can't speak quietly. <laughs> she doesn't know how to do that, so she speaks loudly. That doesn't mean she's more powerful. Judy doesn't say anything at all, but it doesn't mean she's not as powerful. Because it's what's in here. Amen. And it's the authority that you pray with. So if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to do all of the proper uh, things, you just pray the way you know what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. But listen, folks, we've got to pray at night. Yes. We've got yes. to pray at night. Mm -hmm. Father God, thank you. God, forgive us for our lack. Forgive us for thinking we could do it on our own. Forgive us for being asleep when we should have been awake. Yes. yes. Forgive us, Father, for allowing this to happen. Yes. But God, we're awake today. Yes. We have been wakened up by your word. Yes. We have been wakened up by the call of God. And we are responding today. We are responding today, and Lord, we are willing to pray at night. We are willing to march all night. We are willing to come into alignment with what you're doing. We are willing by faith to step into the assignment that you put in front of us today. Those of us that are seasoned veterans, those of us that have fought on many campaigns, mm -hmm. those of us that have, have fought before are coming alongside those that have never yes. e even picked up a yes. sword before. Yes. And they're yes. just learning yes. how to do it today, where they are praying together with us. And we come together in unity, in our hearts and in our spirits, and we join together. People in this room that I barely know their names, they're here for the first time today, but they are coming in to agreement with what you're doing. I join them. I join with some of my oldest and dearest friends that I've known for a lifetime, and I join with them. And we come into unity today. Men, women, uh, young people, old people, we come into unity today, and we fight for our country. Yes. We stand up, and we fight for our country, and we say the word of God, our Father, our Father, yes. our Father, our Father, our Father, which art in heaven, you're in heaven, you're in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Protect your name today, yes. O oh God. Yes. Protect yes. your name. Yes. Protect the holiness of your name. Hallowed Hallowed, hallowed be your name, Father God. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, you have decreed it in heaven. You have announced it in heaven. You have spoken in heaven. It is your word. And we stand on that word. We speak your word today on earth. 
on earth, in America, in our country, in this living room, in our lives. We speak it today, and we stand on your word. We don't care what the media says. We don't care what the, what the, what the politicians say. We don't care what the entertainment people say. We don't care what the corporate people say. We don't care what the educational industry says. Lord, we stand on your word. Honor, inner, inner, as it is in heaven. In heaven. It's the way it is in heaven, and we want it to be that way in earth, and so we speak it, because you spoke it in heaven. And we speak and declare it. On earth, as it is in heaven. Lord, you provide our provision, our daily bread. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into areas that will destroy us. Protect us. Keep us safe. Keep us away from temptation, from destruction. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Give us of our, our sins. Yes. Even as we forgive everyone around us that's ever sinned against us, we come into agreement with your forgiveness. Lord, it's your kingdom. It's not my kingdom. It's not mine. We're not building our kingdom anymore. <coughs> kingdom's dead in the water right now. Your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because yours is the power. The power. And the glory. not just yours up through 2019. It's yours in yes. 2020. Yes. And 2021. Yes. And 2022. Yes. Because it's yours forever. Yes. <laughs> forever.